Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. When Darren Evans wrote about his horrifying experience with a Ouija board demon named Zozo in 2009, hundreds of people claimed that the same thing happened to them. The Zozo demon, Evans claimed, had come to him multiple times in various states. The demon sometimes pretended to be a different spirit, lied or tried to convince Evans that it was someone else. Eventually, though, the Zozo demon couldn't help but make his truly malevolent self known. As it turns out, tales of the Zozo demon go back at least 200 years. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, weirdos. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode… Citizens of Van Meter, Iowa were confronted with a tall, human-like figure with bat-like wings a single horn on its head, and it apparently was bulletproof. What was this supernatural creature people were seeing? A bride-to-be becomes worried when her fiancé disappears, so she contacts a psychic friend to see if she can help. Something sinister creeps into a Christian boarding house. Bram Stoker wrote his classic novel Dracula in 1897 but vampires are much, much older than that. A supposedly cursed doll has remained in the protection of one family for over four generations, but why would this family keep hold of such a demonic item? They are almost always silent, enigmatic figures, usually seen at a distance, up on ridges, silhouetted against the darkening twilight sky, always at around dusk or dawn, quietly looking over and surveying their domain with unknowable purpose and often vanishing in the blink of an eye. What are the Dark Watchers of California? But first, the Zozo Demon has allegedly harassed hundreds via their Ouija boards. But is this demonic force from the spirit world or from our own minds? We begin with that story. If you're new here, Welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, my newsletter, to enter contests, to connect with me on social media. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression or dark thoughts. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. Darren Evans told his story about the Zozo Demon for the first time on March 24, 2009, on an online forum for true ghost stories. He explained how the first time he had an encounter with the demon the Ouija board went wild and flew between the letters Z and O, frantically spelling Z-O, 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 Z-O. Zozo said it had come to take Evans' family to paradise. Evans asked where paradise was, and the plastic arrow, known as the planchette, moved once more, slowly spelling out the word hell. He reported also that Zozo spewed obscenities in what seemed to Evans like Latin or Hebrew. Evans reported how he then rushed into the bathroom, 
where his girlfriend had been giving their one-year-old daughter a bath. His girlfriend was gone, the tub was overflowing, and his daughter was drowning. Though he managed to rescue her that time, Evans claimed the demon was responsible for sending his daughter to the hospital later with an inexplicable infection. It sounds like something out of a horror story, and it very well may be. There's every reason to believe that Evans made it all up. But his story has caught on for a reason. He isn't the only person who claims to have been attacked by the Zozo demon. Hundreds have described their own harrowing experiences. Indeed, the occurrence seemed so popular that a horror film on the Zozo demon, I Am Zozo, was released in 2012. Evans also made an appearance on the popular show Ghost Adventurers in an effort to contact Zozo. All of the stories regarding the Zozo demon are more or less the same. Someone will sit down to play with the Ouija board or anything even remotely resembling one. Sometimes people will meet the Zozo demon on a Ouija app or even just after scribbling a makeshift board on a piece of paper. At first, they think they're talking to the spirit of some dead relative. They'll ask questions and be startled at just how much the spirit seems to know about their loved one's life. And then, suddenly, the arrows will start to fly between the letters Z and O. That's when the threats begin. The Ouija will spell out obscenities and blasphemies and promise to drag one's firstborn son down to hell. My nephew started running around the house screaming, Zozo, 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 and we frantically made him stop, one woman wrote on another forum. The next morning, my nephew wakes me up, and as we're waking up, he asks if we can get breakfast, so I put him in the car and pull out the driveway. Not two minutes later, a car runs a stop sign and slams into us. Many of these stories showed up on the internet after Evan's creepy account went viral, though some of these accounts were already out there. Evan claims that before sharing his story with the internet, he googled the word Zozo himself and found more than a dozen blog posts describing the exact same encounter. Creepier still is that the name Zozo has shown up for more than 200 years. The oldest Zozo story comes from the 1816 book Dictionnaire Infernal by Colin de Plancy. De Plancy tells the story of a young girl who claimed to be possessed by three demons named Mimi, Capulette, and Zozo. The girl went down the streets on all fours, sometimes forward, sometimes behind. Sometimes she walked on her hands, feet in the air, at the risk of putting passers-by in the confidence of her position. Her strange movements, the girl had told people, were commanded by the demons who possessed her. This created enough of a commotion that a priest came to perform an exorcism on her. When the Zozo demon left her body, it was said the windows in the room shattered. Colin de Plancy, though, was a skeptic. While he recorded this paranormal instance in his book, he did note that he didn't believe a word of it. But even his story wasn't the first mention of Zozo. Some speculate that Zozo is actually derived from the Mesopotamian god Pazuzu, who was known to be the ruler of the demons. Further, a symbol etching out the name Zoso as a code for the god Saturn appeared in a banned occult book in 1521. This would later be copied by Led Zeppelin as the symbol for their guitarist Jimmy Page. There could be a more real-world explanation behind this Zozo demon. In 1972, psychologists tested whether people can communicate with the paranormal through only persuasion or human will in what's known as the Philip Experiment. The study made up a fictional person named Philip Aylesford and instructed a group of people to run a seance in order to summon his ghost. The group became convinced that they could feel Philip's presence. They heard knocking sounds coming from the table, felt the table vibrate, 
and at one point even saw the table tilt up onto two legs. They were sure that they had spoken to Philip's ghost and that he had answered their questions. They did not know that, in truth, Philip was just someone the researchers had made up. The researchers concluded that the human mind can, in fact, create spirits on its own will simply through a bit of persuasion and imagination. The Ouija board, consequently, is designed to play tricks against us by working off a principle called the ideometer effect. Our muscles make small subconscious movements without our realizing them, and when we see those movements shift the light piece of plastic on the board, we become convinced that it's happening supernaturally. All this amounts to us being able to scare ourselves into believing the paranormal. At least that's how skeptics explain what's going on in the case of the mass Zozo demon terror. But the terrifying reality is that, in either case, the demons are real and whether they are in our minds or elsewhere is to be debated. It's hard to say which is more terrifying. The idea that a supernatural demon can possess a child's toy or the idea that a demon of the mind exists in our own subconscious, convincing us that what we most fear is real. On September 29, 1903, a series of strange events began in the quiet Iowa community of Van Meter. When the first sighting of what came to be known as the Van Meter Visitor occurred that night, it put the secluded town in the national spotlight. Briefly home to some sort of mysterious creature, Van Meter endured the terror for only a handful of days before the visitations came to an end. But they were not soon forgotten, and the mystery remains unsolved today. In the early morning hours of September 29, 1903, a local tool dealer named U.G. Griffith was making his way home after a long and exhausting day of work. As he got close to his house, he noticed a strange light that was glowing on top of a nearby building. It was bright, beaming into the night sky. Griffith had lived in Van Meter his entire life, and he knew the mysterious light was not supposed to be there. His curiosity got the better of him, and he drove down the road toward the source of the light. As he approached it, though, the light flashed off and then reappeared on another building on the opposite side of the street. Griffith slammed on the brakes, startled by what he had seen. He knew that neither burglars nor pranksters could have done anything like that. A few moments later, the light jumped again, vanishing into the night and leaving Griffith to try and figure out what he has seen. The next morning, Griffith told several people about the incident. They were perplexed but had known Griffith for years. He had a reputation as a solid citizen and an honest man. They couldn't guess what he had seen, but they believed him, and things got even stranger that night. In the early morning hours of September 30th, Van Meter's local physician, Dr. Alcott, was frightened out of his sleep by a blinding white light that was shining into his bedroom window. Alcott jumped out of bed and ran for the front door, snatching a pistol as he did so. He burst out the front door, convinced that he was going to encounter trespassers, and instead came face to face with a tall, human-like figure with massive bat-like wings. Strangest of all, the figure had a single horn on its head which was emanating the blinding bright light. Dr. Alcott didn't hesitate. He immediately opened fire and emptied his revolver at the creature. The bullets had absolutely no effect on it. It just stood there in the murky darkness, staring at him. Alcott spun around and stumbled back into the house. He locked the doors and hid in the kitchen until he was sure the creature was gone. When he gathered enough courage to look outside, the monster was nowhere to be seen. Like Griffith, Alcott shared his encounter the following morning. It was widely believed. After all, he was the town's respected doctor, 
and was not prone to making up stories or playing practical jokes. Two different encounters with the white light creature put the whole town on edge. Something seemed to be out there, jumping on rooftops and lurking in the streets of Van Meter. On October 1st, Clarence Dunn, the manager of the town's bank, was having trouble sleeping. The stories of the midnight prowler had upset him, and he feared the bank might be robbed. In the middle of the night, he decided to walk down to the bank. He took his shotgun with him. He had decided to stand guard at the bank to see what might happen. He got more than he expected. Around 1 a.m., Dunn reported that he heard a weird sound outside, like someone gasping for air or being strangled. As he sat there in the dark with his shotgun gripped tightly in his hands, he suddenly saw the brilliant white light that had been described by Griffith and Alcott. A moment later, a shadowy figure appeared out of the gloom. Without thinking, Dunn fired at the creature. He was convinced that the shotgun pellets had struck the monster, but no trace of blood was left behind. He did, however, find a few three-toed footprints in the muddy street. They were unlike anything that Dunn had seen before. A plaster cast was made of the tracks, but it has vanished over the years. No one in town could figure out what kind of creature would have made the tracks. The next evening, the creature was back. Hardware store owner O.V. White was awakened by an unearthly wail in the darkness. He said it sounded like scraping, grinding metal. White grabbed a nearby rifle. By this time, just about everyone in town was keeping a gun next to the bed and peered out the window. He spotted a strange, dark figure perched on a telephone pole about 15 feet away. White threw open the window, took direct aim at the creature, and fired, scoring a direct hit. The only response from the creature was that it raised its head and looked at him with irritation. It was then that White later claimed he was overwhelmed by a potent stench that was so foul that it made him dizzy and caused him to lose consciousness. The sound of White's rifle had awakened his friend and business partner, Sidney Gregg, who lived nearby. He came to investigate, and once on the street, he also spotted the winged humanoid on the telephone pole. He claimed that it used its large parrot-like beak to climb down the pole. When it reached the ground, he estimated the thing stood almost eight feet tall and had legs like those of a kangaroo. He also saw the bright light that beamed from a horn on the monster's forehead. Greg said that the creature looked around for a moment and then vaulted off into the night, leaping and jumping until it finally took flight, flapping its giant wings. On October 3rd, J. L. Platt Jr., manager of a brick and tile factory outside of town, was drawn to a nearby abandoned coal mine by strange noises that he heard. He colorfully described them as sounding like Satan and a regiment of imps coming forth for battle. When Pratt investigated the eerie sounds, he came face to face with the winged monster at one of the entrances to the mine. According to his story, the beast was not alone. It also had a smaller monster with it, which also emitted a bright light from the horns on its head. The two creatures flew off together, vanishing into the darkness. When word spread about this latest encounter, it was surmised that the old abandoned mine was perhaps the lair of the creature or creatures. The mine extended deep underground, and the tunnels and shafts would make the perfect hiding place for the monsters. It was quickly decided that the men in town would go in search of the creature. A contingent of heavily armed men, carrying any kind of weapon they could find, set up a camp at the mine's entrance so that they could wait for the monsters to return. No one was brave enough to go into the dark depths of the mine to confront the creature in its lair. Late that same night, the two monsters returned to the mine. The men were ready for them. They opened fire, but the hail of bullets seemed to have no effect on the creatures. According to one newspaper report, the reception they received would have sunk the Spanish fleet, but aside from unearthly noise and peculiar odor, they did not seem to mind it but slowly descended the shaft of the old mine. And that 
was the last time the monsters were ever seen. The people of Van Meter sealed off the mine, and as the years passed, the eerie days of 1903 became more legend than fact. It has been told and retold over the years, but no one is any closer today to understanding what happened than they were when the sightings occurred. What was the Van Meter visitor? Was it a hoax? A case of mass hysteria? Or was it real? And if it was, what was it? An alien? A mystery animal? A visitor from another dimension? No one knows, and it's likely that we will never solve this mystery. Up next, a bride-to-be becomes worried when her fiancé disappears, so she contacts a psychic friend to see if she can help. Something sinister creeps into a Christian boarding house. And Bram Stoker wrote his classic novel Dracula in 1897, but vampires are much, much older than that. These stories and more when Weird Darkness returns. No matter the time of day or season, sometimes you need to find a way to rid yourself of those ghostly chills that bring raised hairs and goosebumps to your skin. Other times you're looking for those ghostly chills. Either way, it sounds like you need a mug of Weird Dark Roast Coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee has deep notes of cocoa, caramel, and a touch of sinister sweetness that'll send shivers down your taste buds. This is an exclusive coffee that I selected specifically for you, my weirdo family. Weird Dark Roast is not available in stores, coffee houses, mad scientist labs, or even the dark web, but you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee, fresh roasted to order so it's as fresh as it can be when it lands on your doorstep and knocks three times. Grab yours now at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee does not actually knock on your door because it doesn't have arms or hands, so if you hear knocks at the door and no one answers when you ask who it is, it's probably paranormal and you should just leave the door shut and locked. It was 9 a.m. on a Sunday morning. My friend Devin called me in a panic. I had not talked to her since we both graduated school a few months back. Hearing her in such a distraught manner was very different than the calm demeanor she had at school. Strange thing was, I had happened to be sitting at my desk on the computer scanning her Facebook page when she called. Devin then told me her fiancé, Corey, had not returned the prior evening she informed me that she called the friend he was supposed to hang out with the night before, but he had never made it. She knew something was wrong. I scrolled down the page and saw pictures of the two of them, and I immediately felt her pain. The feeling of dread and sorrow came over me. Corey and Devin had been engaged for a short time, but they had known each other from high school and were madly in love. I listened to Devin talk about how they'd been planning the wedding and how everything was going great, and then she asked me for a psychic reading to find out where he was. I was not surprised by this response. During school, I had come out as a psychic, and surprisingly, many of my friends were receptive to it. I gave readings to those who had asked, not only for the practice, but also to enhance my abilities. Devin had heard from one of our mutual friends about my accuracy and my abilities, at this moment, however, I didn't need my abilities to hear the worry in Devin's voice. She asked me if Corey had run off or if he was kidnapped. She also stated that because it had not been 24 hours, the police would not do anything. I had her on the phone with me, and I was gazing at his picture, and then a vision of him came to me. I saw him on the side of the road near a small bridge. He seemed to have stopped because of car trouble. There was another car with a man kind of rough-looking. I see Corey getting into this man's car, and they drive away. Then the vision comes to a dirt road and a trailer. I felt a cold and sharp pain. 
I knew Corey had been in grave danger, but I didn't want to tell her. So I hoped that somehow they would find him. Suddenly, my doorbell rang. I let it ring a couple of times. I tell Devin about the man who picked up Corey, but left the other stuff out. The doorbell rang again. I got off the phone and went to look at the person at the door. It started to piss me off, so I finished telling her and let her off the phone. I got up and peered out the window. I could see from the second floor of my house a young man with a red hat on and a white t-shirt and blue jeans standing at my door. What? I yelled, irritated. He did not move or respond. It was probably solicitor selling candy bars or something. I walked downstairs and see the young man through the fogged glass at the window. I opened the door and yelled, what? There was no one there. I looked around thinking maybe the kids in the neighborhood were messing with me. I walked out of the house and around the corner. There hadn't been any bushes or trees for anyone to hide behind, and there wasn't a soul in sight. It was eerily quiet on the street. I was really weirded out and knew there had been someone at my door, but ignored the weirdness and went back inside. A few hours went by, and I'm on my computer when I get a call from Devin again. She tells me the police called, and they found his car by a bridge. She said they put out a bolo for him, and then I asked her what he looked like. She said he had on a white t-shirt and blue jeans. For a second, I thought about the young man at my door. I live hundreds of miles away. I ignored the thought. Devin said the police would call her if they found him. We talked a little longer, and I comforted her. I had a horrible feeling in my gut, though. I didn't want to admit it to myself. The next day I woke and saw on Facebook the missing person posts. They had police out searching for Corey trying to find any leads they could. From what they knew, he must have gotten into another man's car and disappeared. I dropped my kids off at school and came back home. I made myself a cup of coffee and went to sit down when the doorbell rang. I looked downstairs out the window. It's the same young man from the day before. What the hell? I said out loud. I set my coffee down on my computer desk and ran downstairs, flinging the front door open. The door opens and again, no one is there. I run outside looking around everywhere and yet no one is around. I walk back into the house and the phone rings. I answer the phone. It's Devin, sobbing. What's wrong? I asked. He's dead. He's dead. I can't believe he's gone. Devin was sobbing. Oh my God, Devin, I'm so sorry. Not knowing what else to say, I was only wishing I'd never given her a reading. They found him in some trailer. His red baseball cap he was wearing was how they knew it was him. Wait, a red baseball cap? I was in shock and then said, the boy at my door was wearing a red baseball cap. What? She asked. Yesterday and today, a boy wearing a red baseball cap, white shirt, and blue jeans showed up ringing my doorbell, but when I opened the door, no one was there. I thought I was going crazy. Devin was quiet for a long moment. Thank you, she said. Uh, for what? I was surprised by her response. We made a pact that if one of us dies first, we would come back to say goodbye, she said. You're welcome? I didn't know what to say. We said our goodbyes. When I got off the phone, I sobbed, sitting on my stairs. It reminded me of my husband's great-grandma and how I knew when she was going to die. Tried to get the family to go see her, and the next morning, a bird landed on my window, and I knew she'd passed. But Corey, he was the only one who came back to say goodbye. My story is one from England. When I turned 16, 16 years ago, my mother sent me to live in a hostel for young women as we simply did not get along. This was a Christian-led organization running a beautiful detached house in Royal Tunbridge Wells. There was a ground floor level with residential lounges, one for smokers, one for non-smokers, a staff reception, offices, and staff apartment at the end of the central hallway a basement and first floor level each with four rooms and shared facilities. Then my floor. 
the attic floor with five small rooms and shared facilities. At each end of the house sat a flight of stairs. Everyone used the front flight, no one used the back ones. They were cold and always poorly lit. You felt like you had to run up them as if someone was coming up behind you faster. I was given the room at the back. Upon opening the door, the left is immediate wall, the other side of it was the back staircase. I had a four-drawer clothes chest against it, then a sink in a corner. Along the opposite wall to the door was a central small sash window, a low coffee table pushed up near it with a 15-inch TV on it, then on the right wall a built-in closet in one corner and a bed pressed up to that wall with the headboard against the other wall, also a bedside table. Floor space was about four meters by four. I feel it's important to know my mental state at this point. Teen hormones with feelings of abandonment and being unloved. As well as relief to be away from home in a great environment surrounded by potential friends. Things started to happen there after a few months. TV channels would tune out, so I'd have to retune them often. The old sash window was stiff and took a lot of work to wedge open. It would then slam shut in the night. I gave up opening it. Every so often it sounded as though someone was dashing up the stairs, but then vanished as no one opened the door into the hall. My room always felt heavy, as if I was being watched, specifically from the left corner of the room by the sink. About four months in, I was woken at around 11 p.m. to the sound of someone knocking on the wall beside my bed in different areas. It was terrifying, so I ran into the hall and knocked on the door of the girl's room who shared the wall. She was awake and reading but a bit annoyed with me for disturbing her as she hadn't heard a thing and thought I was nuts. The other thing that happened was seen in a dream like half-awake state, as if in my mind's eye. A dark figure of a man crouching down in a squat, leaning his elbows on his thighs, hands together, smirking at me and asking, are you ready? He gave me a feeling of pure terror. Horrific, to say the least, and I told myself it was a nightmare. The main incident, I feel it's not as explainable. Everything else has a possible rational explanation. It was at about 6 p.m., and I was propped up on my bed watching TV. From the corner of my eye, I saw my shaving razor move from my chest of drawers to the center of the room, laying on the carpet in line with the TV. It went in one movement, no noise, no bouncing or hitting anything on the way down. It was kept with my toothbrush, paste, and tweezers and a glass tumbler on my chest of drawers, central, not likely to fall or move on its own. The other items were not disturbed. There was no breeze as the window was shut. It made no clanging sound as it came away from the glass. It moved at a speed slower than if it was thrown, but faster than if it was carried. I ran down the stairs to the smoking lounge in a flash. I don't know how I managed it. <laughs> a fellow resident was there and she commented that I looked as if I'd just seen a ghost, white-faced with red-rimmed eyes. I told her what had happened and she chuckled to herself, telling me I was lucky. She had seen much more here. Very often, a young service boy carrying a silver tray with two hands, looking straight ahead as he walks partially down the hall, then turns through a wall. He has no feet, as though he's walking on a lower level than us. She believed years ago servants used the rear staircases and that they slept in the attic. Also that the room layout was different then. I've traced the property back to 1881 records. It was a family home at one point, with servants, switching hands many times. I've yet to find out any details about what may have happened there over the years, but it is quite interesting. Whilst I lived there, I heard stories of it once being an old sewing house where ladies would go for tea to sew together, wearing beautiful dresses. The story of Count Dracula, as many of us know it, was created by Bram Stoker, an Irishman, in 1897. But most of the action takes place in England, 
from the moment the Transylvanian vampire arrives on a shipwrecked vessel in Whitby, North Yorkshire, with plans to make his lair in the spookily named Carfax Estate, west of the river in London. But Dracula wasn't the first vampire in English literature, let alone the first to stalk England. The vampire first made its way into English literature in John Polidori's 1819 short story, The Vampire. Polidori's vampire, Lord Ruthven, is inspired by a thinly disguised portrait of the predatory English poet Lord Byron in Lord Caroline Lamb's novel Glenarvan in 1816. So the first fictional vampire was actually a satanic English lord. It's nearly 200 years since this romantic Byronic archetype for a vampire emerged, but what do we know about English belief in vampires outside of fiction? New research at the University of Hertfordshire has uncovered and reappraised a number of vampire myths, and they are not all confined to the realms of fiction. The Kroglin vampire reputedly first appeared in Cumberland to Amos Fisher in the 1750s. Its story is retold by Dr. Augustus Hare, a clergyman in his Memorials of a Quiet Life in 1871. According to this legend, the vampire scratches at the window before disappearing into an ancient vault. The vault is later discovered to be full of coffins that have been broken open and their contents horribly mangled and distorted, scattered over the floor. One coffin, however, remains intact, but the lid has been loosened. And there, shriveled and mummified but quite intact, lies the Kroglin vampire. Elsewhere in Cumbria, the natives of Renwick were once known as bats due to the monstrous creature that is said to have flown out of the foundations of a rebuilt church there in 1733. The existence of vampire bats which sucked blood wouldn't be confirmed until 1832 when Charles Darwin sketched one feeding off a horse on his voyage to South America in the Beagle. The creature in Renwick has been referred to as a cockatrice a mythical creature with a serpent's head and tail and the feet and wings of a cockerel by Cumbrian County history. But it's the myth of the vampire bat that has prevailed in the surrounding villages and is recorded in conversations in local archives and journals. What picture emerges then in this history of the English vampire? The Kroglin vampire has never been verified, but it has an afterlife in the 20th century appearing as the British Vampire in 1977 in an anthology of horror by Daniel Farson, who turns out to be Stoker's great-grandnephew. But there is one case that has no connection to fiction, the little-known Buckinghamshire Vampire, recorded by William of Newburgh in the 12th century. Historical records show that St. Hugh, the Bishop of Lincoln, was called upon to deal with the terrifying revenant and learned to his astonishment after contacting other theologians that similar attacks had happened elsewhere in England. St. Hugh was told that no peace would be had until the corpse was dug up and burned, but it was decided that an absolution, a declaration of forgiveness by the church absolving one from sin, would be a more seemly way to disable the vampire. When the tomb was opened, the body was found to have not decomposed the absolution was laid inside on the corpse's chest by the archdeacon, and the vampire was never seen again wandering from his grave. The Buckinghamshire Revenant did not have a vampire burial, but such practices are evidence of a long-standing belief in vampires in Britain. Astonishingly, the medieval remains of the what are thought to be the first English vampires have been found in the Yorkshire village of Warham Percy, the bones of over 100 vampire corpses have now been uncovered, buried deep in village pits. The bones were excavated more than a half century ago and date back to before the 14th century. They were at first thought to be the result of cannibalism during a famine or a massacre in the village, but on further inspection in 2017, the burned and broken skeletons were linked instead to deliberate mutilations perpetrated to prevent the head returning to harm the living 
beliefs common in folklore at the time. The inhabitants of Warham Percy showed widespread belief in the undead returning as revenants or reanimated corpses, and so fought back against the risk of vampire attacks by deliberately mutilating their own dead, burning bones and dismembering corpses, including those of women, children, and teenagers, in an attempt to stave off what they believed could be a plague of vampires. This once flourishing village was completely deserted in the aftermath. Just recently, at an ancient Roman site in Italy, the severed skull of a 10-year-old child was discovered with a large rock inserted in the mouth to prevent biting and bloodsucking. The skull belongs to a suspected 15th-century revenant, which they're calling locally the Vampire of Lugano. There has been a wealth of other stories from the UK and other parts of Western Europe, but despite this, thanks to the Dracula legend, most people still assume such practices and beliefs belong to remote parts of Eastern Europe. But our research is continuing to examine vampire burials in the UK and is making connections to local myths and their legacy in English literature, many years before the Byronic fiend Count Dracula arrived in Yorkshire, carrying his own supply of Transylvanian soil. When Weird Darkness returns, a supposedly cursed doll has remained in the protection of one family for over four generations, but why would this family keep hold of such a demonic item? And what are the Dark Watchers of California? We'll learn more up next. In 2025, neutron bombs wipe out much of the world's drinkable water. For the next several years, survivors exist in deplorable conditions and their rations are dwindling. One woman arises from the camp, determined to improve conditions. Charlotte is ready to do whatever it takes to ensure clean water for her fellow survivors. Water is almighty. Whoever controls the water rules the world. Can Charlotte prevent the power from falling into the wrong hands? Weird Darkness Publishing presents Working for H2O by Sarah Faith, now available in paperback, Kindle, and audiobook versions on Amazon and at WeirdDarkness.com. Joliet Joliet is a doll, a haunted doll at that, a so-called cursed item that has remained in the protection of one family for over four generations. So why would this family keep hold of a demonic, cursed item? The doll is currently owned by a lady that goes by the name of Anna. We're not 100% sure that is her real name or a pseudonym to stay anonymous in this case. Regardless, Anna claims that the doll has been in the possession of her family for over a century and it has always carried the spooky ability to cry at night, sounding a lot like a baby that had just woken up. Sometimes there's only one cry, other times there is a chorus of four different babies in distress simultaneously. Anna believes that she knows the four souls that are trapped inside the doll's body because they are actually linked to her family tree. This close bond with the trapped spirits is the reason behind her family keeping the doll. This paranormal case seemed to have began when Anna's great-grandmother was given the doll when she was carrying her second child. It was a gift from a friend of the family that had a dark and hidden personality, and she really didn't like Anna's great-grandmother. Anna now believes that this woman was so jealous and twisted inside that a dark force was created from her which entered the doll. 
the great-grandmother eventually gave birth to a lovely little boy who, tragically, died three days later from an unexplained illness. This same tragedy would unfold for at least four generations. From this point onward, every female member of Anna's direct family tree would have two children, a boy and a girl. The male infant would always die just three days after its birth. Anna's great-grandmother also insisted that her dead son had somehow entered the doll. She would break her heart listening to him crying through the doll in the depths of night. She could never get rid of the doll because she firmly believed that it contained her dead son's soul. When she died, she passed the doll on to her daughter, Anna's grandmother, for safekeeping. This turned out to be another deadly move. Anna's grandmother had two children, male and female, and the boy died three days after birth. Anna also lost her son three days after he was born, and she believes his cries have been added to the doll's disturbing orchestra. Each mother in the family has refused to give up this paranormal doll. They all believe that it somehow contains a trace of their baby's soul. The strange thing about this case is that the cries of the doll can only be heard by female members of Anna's family. Meandering along the coast of California from Monterey County all the way up into central San Luis Obispo County is the Santa Lucia Mountain Range, a rugged expanse of peaks and wilderness that is imposing enough to have posed a hurdle to early Spanish explorers making their way to the California coast. It is a place of undeniable natural beauty and history, and it has long been said to be the haunt of inscrutable shadow beings that seem to stand and observe our world from afar. What have come to be known as the Dark Watchers are typically said to be very tall humanoid entities, ranging in height from 7 feet tall all the way up to around 15 feet tall, dressed all in black and wearing flowing cloaks and wide-brimmed hats, with many sightings also mentioning some sort of staves or sticks into the being's hands. Facial features are not typically seen, and they are almost always silent, enigmatic figures, usually seen at a distance up on ridges silhouetted against the darkening twilight sky, always at around dusk or dawn, quietly looking over and surveying their domain with unknowable purpose and often vanishing in the blink of an eye especially if one is to try and draw closer. Such bizarre entities have been reported for centuries, with the accounts supposedly traced back to at least the native Chumash tribe of the central coast of California and the Channel Islands, who apparently had a rich tradition of lore on these enigmatic beings and called them the Old Ones. Early Spanish explorers and Mexican ranchers also knew of them, referring to them as Los Vigilantes Oscuros and they were often seen by early explorers and soldiers in the region, who described the unsettling experience of being observed by them from cliffs high above. These beings have been sighted ever since, going on to be mentioned in countless literary references and sighting reports. One very well-known literary mention of the mysterious beings was written of in John Steinbeck's 1938 book, The Long Valley in which the creatures were written of in a short story called Flight, particularly in one passage that reads, Pepe looked up to the top of the next dry, withered ridge. He saw a dark form against the sky, a man's figure standing on top of a rock, and he glanced away quickly not to appear curious. When a moment later he looked up again, the figure was gone. Pepe looked suspiciously back every minute or so, and his eyes sought the tops of the ridges ahead. Once on a white barren spur, he saw a black figure for a moment, but he looked quickly away, for it was one of the Dark Watchers. No one knew who the Watchers were, nor where they lived, but it was better to ignore them and never to show interest in them. They did not bother one who stayed on the trail and minded his own business. This is undeniably based 
on the pervasive lore of these entities, and other writers at around the same time made mention of the Dark Watchers, including notable poet Robinson Jeffers in his poem Such Counsels You Gave to Me and Other Poems, in which he calls them forms that look human but certainly are not human, and says of them, he thought it might be one of the Watchers who are often seen in this length of coast range, forms that look human to human eyes but certainly are not human. They come from behind ridges to watch, but when he approached it, he recognized the shabby clothes and pale hair, and even the averted forehead and concave line from the eye to the jaw, so that he was not surprised when the figure turning toward him in the quiet twilight showed his own face. Then it melted and merged into the shadows beyond it. These literary accounts draw from the same local traditions, which have gone back centuries and continue on into this day. In the mid-1960s, there was an alleged sighting of the Dark Watchers made by a high school teacher who was out hiking in the range at the Monterey Peninsula. As he walked along, he claimed he had seen a tall, dark figure looming up upon a ridge which seemed to be in the process of merely standing and contemplating the scenery. The hiker called out to the mysterious figure, and at that instance the entity simply dissolved from sight as if it had never been there at all. There have been numerous supposed sightings of these strange entities since, right up into very recent years. One strange occurrence was told of by a witness from Moreno Valley, California, who in 2011 said, "...many years ago I was with a friend driving through a dirt field here in Moreno Valley near Alessandro, Old East Part, near what I believe were old abandoned barns that I always had heard were haunted when my friend's car broke down. Could have been coincidence, it was a beat-up Volkswagen bug. It was dusk at best, and there was no way we were going to make it out of the field before it was pitch black, and instead of chancing getting retardedly lost and or hurt in the dark, we decided to sleep in the car and set out in the morning to go get help to tow the car. It was way before the days of everyone having cell phones and quick help. As we were killing time in the pitch black now, we were hanging out inside and outside the car, killing time, sharing smokes, and we started to distinctly see what looked like black shadows, evenly distributed, completely encircling us. They did not move, they stayed motionless, but were of significant size, and based on the distance, I would say at least the size of a small car like the bug we ourselves were in. Whatever these were seemed hunched over, perhaps kneeling. Time passed, they never moved, and though we walked around the car and got in and out of the car to see if what we were seeing was some sort of optical illusion, yet we couldn't explain or discredit what we were seeing. To this day, it racks my brain. In 2013, there was a report made by an Elizabeth Benitez of San Mateo, California, who claimed to have seen the specters in broad daylight near the San Luis Obispo Reservoir. She would say of this encounter, I remember one day my friend and I were coming back from Los Angeles. We passed the San Luis Obispo Reservoir, and as we drove on the road, I saw something at a distance down at the end of the mountain. It was a really big, human figure, but it wasn't. It had a black cape, kind of like the Grim Reaper, and it was leaning over, holding on to a staff at a puddle of water, or so that is what it seemed at a distance. It was in daytime, too, so I could identify it wasn't a person. Even in mid-light, he was very black and reminded me of a raven. I told my friend that was driving to look over at the mountains, and surprisingly, she was able to see a glimpse of it. I asked her what she saw without giving her my details, and she said exactly what I saw. She only looked at it for about five seconds, but she was able to see it. She almost lost control of the car, too, when she looked away at it, and I begged her to go back and see it, but she was very tired of driving already. These dark watchers are real. Also in 2013 was an account from a witness known only as Brian from Hollister, California, who claimed to have seen the entities as they were driving home. He would say of the incident, We were coming home to the San Juan Batista Hollister side when we saw a very large, dark figure standing at the edge of the mountains, which is extremely weird 
since I've never seen anyone cross over the barbed wire fence, and I travel that road daily and at all hours. We drove by it slowly behind the figure, noticing it staring off into the distant valleys and mountains, Fremont's Peak. It appeared to have a large cape with straight shoulders that were very broad. It seemed to have a hunch on its back. At first, from a distance, I thought it was a condor, but when I got closer, it stood almost over 10 feet tall. It did not notice us driving behind it, but when we found a spot on the cliffy road to turn around and get a better look, it was gone. In 2015, there was a report from a long-distance runner calling himself Joey in Silmar, California. The witness said that he'd been out training for a race in the mountains when he saw something peculiar, saying of his experience, Time of the day was 2 p.m. I was running and up in an area where no human could climb without gear, I saw a black figure in plain daylight. I never seen anything like it up in the mountain. It was darker than dark, could not explain it. A year passed and today, again January 24th, I saw it again and in the same spot. There have been many other reports as well. As recently as 2018, there was a report from a witness from Ojai, California who was out hiking in the mountains when he came across something very bizarre indeed. He would say, I was hiking up a remote trail up the 33 in Ojai. I was about an hour up the mountain no people, no cars in sight. As I was hiking, I had this eerie feeling I was being watched. I looked up at the top of the mountain. It was a black figure. I waved jokingly, not really thinking the object was a person. It waved back. Thinking I was maybe tripping or that it was a tree waving in the wind, I took a puff of my cigarette, only to see the figure blow out a plume of smoke as well. I started seeing it flowing, and I say flowing, almost floating vertically. I ran like hell back to my car, spraining my knee in the process. There are numerous other accounts of seeing these inexplicable shadow beings out in the wilderness silently surveying the land, to the point that, rather interestingly, John Steinbeck's own son, Thomas Steinbeck, wrote an entire book on the subject after having his own encounter he would go on to research the lore of the Dark Watchers and pen the book In Search of the Dark Watchers, along with co-author Benjamin Brode, which goes into quite a lot of depth into the phenomenon and its cultural origins. Some have pointed to this being as a trick of light or an illusion, but that somehow seems to be an inadequate explanation for the entirety of this phenomenon. It seems that this is a phenomenon for which there are no clear answers and those enigmatic tall beings dressed in dark upon the cliffs and ridges of these mountains at twilight remain a baffling mystery. Are these just illusions or hallucinations? If so, why should they be confined to this one mountain range? There is also the idea that this may be due to the presence of infrasound signals in the area which can be caused by natural processes such as the wind along the rocks and can have strange effects on the human psyche. But again, why should the Dark Watchers legend take root here of all places, if that is the case? And why would the reports be so consistent in the appearance and behavior of the entities? Could this be something else? Are these some sort of supernatural or even interdimensional entities here on some unknown mission? It's impossible to tell, and the Dark Watchers of California remain a compelling mystery that really captures the imagination. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me anytime with your questions or comments at darren at weirddarkness.com. Darren is D-A-R-R-E-N. Weirddarkness.com is also where you can find all of my social media, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, visit the store for Weird Darkness t-shirts, hoodies, mugs, phone cases, and more merchandise, sign up for monthly contests, find other podcasts that I host, and find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression or dark thoughts. Also on the website, if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell, 
you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. All stories in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find source links or links to the authors in the show notes. Zozo and the Ouija Board was written by Mark Oliver for All That's Interesting. The Van Meter Visitor is by Troy Taylor for American Hauntings, Inc. Spirit Drawn to Teenage Emotions is by Lemurian Emerald, posted at Your Ghost Stories. Older Than Dracula is by Sam George for Ancient Origins. Juliet the Haunted Doll was written by Chris for Real Paranormal Experiences. Back to Say Goodbye is by Judy Rad, posted at MyHauntedLife2.com. And The Dark Watchers of California is by Brent Swanser for Mysterious Universe. Weird Darkness is a production and trademark of Marlar House Productions. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Ephesians 4, verse 29. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And a final thought. When we feel empowered to overcome challenges, we become unstoppable. Tanya Dalton I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness.